All right. Well, we said we were going to begin at uh, nine o'clock this morning and it's nine o'clock. And so um, I'm very excited because we are embarking on a new journey through a new book. And uh, I was a little uncertain as to whether or not I would enjoy this. And then I got through the first, uh, the introduction in the first chapter, and I think I'm going to like it. So um, I found this little cartoon um, on the internet, and it spoke to me in terms of what we're going to be studying, because uh, how often in our lifetimes does our perspective about what God is doing with us change. And at times we feel like maybe God is picking on us or pushing us or flicking us off the cliff. And then at other times we feel um, the presence of God as the hand that catches us and embraces us when we uh, need refuge or, or safety. So uh, I think that little cartoon said it all for me. Perfect. Mahatma Gandhi, at least this is attributed to him, said there are as many different religions as there are individuals. And globally, there are estimated uh, today in 2021 to be over 4,000 different religions. And within Christianity, 45,000 different brands of Christianity. And so the reason I put this up here is because I, um, I thought about making you all sign a waiver to take this course. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to make a disclaimer or um, at least share my feelings a little bit about uh, what, what we're embarking on. We're going to be looking at a lot of different ways that people have experienced God in our world. And the one thing that concerns me the most about doing something like this, I think for some of us, that's no big deal. For others, uh, we have been brought up with very cherished uh, systems of beliefs. Uh, ideas about God, uh, experiences that we have had that have defined God for us. And my concern is that I don't want what we're talking about in class uh, to be disruptive of anyone's faith or their beliefs uh, or what they think is important. Uh, the reason we're talking about this is to become more globally aware of how people have believed in God uh, throughout history, particularly in the three great Abrahamic uh, traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And whether or not uh, any or all of these other systems of belief speak uh, to what you think is right or real uh, or what you have experienced in your life is totally up to you. Nobody is going to be trying to convince anyone uh, to change their beliefs. But what I see this course uh, or this book as doing for us and the other teachers can speak up if they feel differently. But I think this uh, helps to bring us to an awareness uh, of how many different belief systems there are. And for each individual in the world, as, as Gandhi suggested, um, they, they have a belief tradition within themselves. And for that person, that belief system is valid. So whether or not we embrace it, it doesn't matter. That's that's totally up to you. What What is important in your view of God is is your own unique view of God, but it's valid to somebody. And so that's why we're learning about it and, and why I think it's important. So that's my disclaimer. And I, I really hope we enjoy this book. I think it looks like it's going to be uh, some fun. I teach uh, graduate students. Everybody knows that. And one of the things when I have students uh, write what is called a research analysis of somebody else's work and delve into it, one of the things that I insist on is that they look at the author and uh, try to figure out, does this person have any specific biases that I might want to be aware of? And so this is the author of our book, uh, Karen Armstrong. And I did a little bit of background uh, research on her just so I'd have something to present today. And I think there are some things that uh, about her that will be helpful for us to kind of keep in mind because it um, speaks to the perspective from which I think she writes. Uh, you saw her in the, the last two weeks in the video, so you know that she had a British accent. She is English. Uh, she was born in Wildmore, England in 1944. Uh, she came up through the Irish Catholic uh, school system, and uh, in some of her writings, she uh, reveals a very almost abusive situation between her teachers and the students, uh, which was very typical of, of schools in the 1950s 
uh, in, in the Catholic system. And so um, I, I think that maybe kind of set the stage for some of her later feelings about religion. And she even talks in, in this book as uh, coming out of that system, that training system in the Irish Catholic uh, tradition, uh, and finding God as being very vague and distant and pompous and arrogant. And those that's my summary of her words, but that's, that's how she felt about it, not how I felt about it. And she revealed that uh, she thought that there was more emphasis on the subculture of religion or the, the patterns of believing rather than on actually uh, teaching students to have uh, a connection with God, a spiritual life, and, and so forth. In spite of all of that, she entered a convent, and she became a nun, and she remained a nun for seven years, and then later left the convent. Um, this is not in our textbook, but in other writings, uh, she left the convent as a, a disbeliever. Uh, she no longer uh, felt uh, that she had any relationship with this distant God that the the Orthodox Church had, had left her with, the Orthodox Catholic Church had left her with. But nevertheless, after 13 years, uh, she began to identify herself once again as a freelance monotheist, uh, but she does practice uh, Buddhism, uh, the contemplative uh, aspects of Buddhism as her way of engaging spiritually with the universe. So I, I just think that's important for us to know. Um, Ms. Armstrong uh, tried to get a PhD in English literature. She wrote a dissertation on Alfred Lord Tennyson, but it was rejected by the committee. And most graduate students who had worked that hard to get that far and only had uh, to defend a dissertation would go back and redo the dissertation and redefend it. Um, she walked away from it. She decided that wasn't for her, and so she never did complete. Uh, her doctoral work, even though she came very close. Uh, she actually became a very prolific writer. She writes on topics of religion. Uh, she's produced documentaries for TV. And I don't know if you caught this in the introduction, but she actually makes a reference to uh, having epilepsy. And uh, she kind of pondered the question, you know, I wonder if the, the saints of old, uh, who were very visionary, uh, if, if what they were experiencing uh, was less about an ecstatic uh, relationship with um, uh, the sacred mystery that, that we call God and more uh, related to a problem with their brain, a uh, problem with epilepsy. And so that got my curiosity peaked, and I started doing some research, research on that. And indeed, she has a disorder called temporal lobe epilepsy which is capable of producing visual disturbances, auras, changes in sounds or awareness, and in some people, uh, ecstatic religious experiences. And uh, so she has kind of a different perspective about that stuff because when it happens to her, she knows that it's uh, abnormal nerve transmission in her brain that is causing uh, some of those experiences at least to, to happen. And the reason I found this interesting is because there have been neurologists and, and psychiatrists uh, from time to time who uh, felt, uh, based on uh, some writings from the 1800s, that Joseph Smith may also have had temporal lobe epilepsy, also a very uh, visionary person. And specifically, uh, what they were looking at was uh, some of the witness of Joseph's mother, Lucy Mack Smith, when Joseph was a young boy, uh, she would describe how he would uh, have the family completely entranced with uh, his tales of uh, early Americans, of Native Americans. And uh, when, when he gave these descriptions, she said it was, you know, it was almost like he was living them and he was relating them to the family. Um, and so there's, there's no proof one way or the other. We don't know if Joseph Smith had temporal lobe epilepsy. It's been argued the other way that that was not the case. But he certainly had a very vivid imagination. And, um, you know, based on what our author said, it just kind of brought that back uh, to my memory. All right. I want to do some cleanup from last week. Last week, somebody uh, brought up uh, some common information about one of the pagan gods, Mithra, and the birth of Jesus Christ. And um, the, I think what was suggested was that uh, the, the Christian community decided that uh, Jesus Christ's birthday was going to be December 25th. And that was interesting because it was supposedly also the birthday of the Roman god Mithra. 
And so the, the background on that story, uh, Mithra was kind of a minor god that uh, was first uh, being written about around 65 BCE, so about a generation before Jesus was born. But it wasn't until a couple hundred years after uh, Jesus uh, when the Christian church was beginning to think about uh, birth dates and, and when possibly Jesus was born. And so the December 25th kind of came into conflict. Uh, there, there's really no evidence that Mithra was ever claimed to be born on the 25th. Uh, the Romans, of course, believed uh, that the winter solstice was important, which would have been around the 21st of December. Um, but nevertheless, the Christians wanted to make sure that, that Jesus was the only one with that birthday. And so their early church fathers did some writing and, and suggested that uh, it was Jesus who had that birthday and not, and not Mithra. Uh, they also suggested that Jesus predated Mithra, and there have been arguments both, both ways, but it looks like Mithra was around for at least 60 years before Jesus was. But that brings up the question of something called comparative mythology. And so uh, I, I was interested in this some years ago. I collected a little bit of information about it, and I'll share with you what I have uh, when there are some common themes between religions, uh, particularly between pagan religions and uh, Abrahamic religions. And so these are the ones that I'm at least aware of, and I'm just going to list them for you. Um, so the creation stories, the creation of humankind, uh, typically from clay or dust, or the creation stories that are very uh, complex. Those occur both in the Judaic uh, tradition, the Judeo-Christian -Christ tradition, as well as in other uh, pagan traditions. Uh, the idea of first human. So we have Adam and Eve. The word Adam is actually the Hebrew word for first man. It's not a, uh, it's not a formal name. It means first man. Uh, other pagan religions or other uh, uh, religions also acknowledge uh, first human stories. Uh, the acquisition of fire. I didn't really think of this as being something that came out of uh, our tradition, but uh, there is a book of Enoch. It's, it's a, an apocryphal Old Testament book. It's not in our Bibles. But in the book of Enoch, fire was given to the humans by fallen angels, angels that fell from heaven. So sort of by default, we have uh, an acquisition of fire story in our tradition, even though, even though it's not one that we're very familiar with. The flood myth. Uh, this has been around and is definitely uh, permeates uh, a number of uh, both Abrahamic religions as well as non-Abrahamic religions. Uh, the first flood myth was the epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh was um, a half, sort of, well, sort of a half man, half God. He was actually two thirds God and one third man uh, from Southern Iraq, from Mesopotamia, the early uh, cradle of civilization. And in the epic of Gilgamesh, uh, a man whose name was Utnapishtim, uh, was commanded to build a large boat uh, to collect animals two by two and put them on the boat and save them because the world was about to be flooded. And so this and this was a non-Christian religion or non-Abrahamic religion. This was an early Mesopotamian uh, um, religion with multiple gods. Uh, so anyway, they clearly have uh, the, the story of the flood myth that predates the Noah story. Uh, and that that's that's been demonstrated. That's not uh, in question by any of the uh, the scholars who talk about it. Uh, dying gods being brought back to life. That happens in many of the ancient religions. Uh, creative sacrifice. Of course, we know that uh, the Jews were commanded to give sacrifices to God, and and certainly that's been a part of of many different religions. Um, battles with giants. Uh, in the Old Testament, we have Goliath, and uh, there are other. Uh, mythical traditions for uh, other religions that have, have similar accounts. Dragons and serpents. We have the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Uh, typically, dragons and serpents represent something evil or bad, and we have that in the book of um, Genesis, and also uh, in the apocryphal book of Daniel, which is not part of uh, the Protestant tradition. Uh, there is a story of Daniel uh, doing, I, I believe he was doing battle with a dragon uh, who, who was actually the god Baal. He was doing battle with Baal, but in the form of a dragon or something like that. Um, let's see. Other religions have customs that are prescribed uh, by the gods, uh, ways for the people to live. We have the Law of Moses, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, other religions have what I would call other worlds or underworlds. 
uh, in Christianity. We, um, whether we acknowledge them or not, everybody uh, has different views of it, but uh, at least we have uh, scripture that talk about heaven and hell. Uh, miraculous births, uh, lots of lots of accounts, lots of mythical stories of uh, gods having human uh, relationships with humans and creating offspring. There are mythical stories of virgin births. There are mythical stories uh, of people having babies in old age, like uh, Sarah did with Abraham. Um, so that is not unique uh, to our tradition. And then uh, many of these traditions also have. Uh, eschatological or end of the world uh, types of stories. So in the field of comparative mythology, uh, we'll just begin by acknowledging that we, that we are not alone in, uh, in some of these beliefs. Uh, there are some theories about why civilizations share these common stories. Uh, one theory is that uh, we know that humans uh, dispersed from a common location about 65,000 years ago, and that was Africa. Uh, so there may have been uh, rudiments of some of these stories that were taken with the people as they moved up into Europe and into Asia and different uh, parts of the world and uh, may have uh, kind of developed those uh, similar stories into um, uh, religious traditions that sound a little bit familiar to each other. Uh, certainly, as, the, as pe the number of people in the world grew, uh, there, there, yeah, and, and commerce began. Uh, merchants going back and forth were capable of sharing stories between cultures. Um, one thought is that there's a need to resolve common tensions or questions that we have as uh, just as part of being uh, a human. Uh, we have uh, similar psychological forces at work, whether we grew up in the United States or in Japan or in Russia or in any other part of the world. Uh, we have angst about life and death. We have angst about what you know happens to us after this life. Uh, and it may well be because of those similar kinds of psychological forces that uh, it resulted in people developing uh, stories that uh, provided some uh, level of uh, answers in a very complex world that they didn't always understand very well. And then there is uh, what, what's called the mythical evolution theory. Uh, and somebody uh, has observed, some scholar observed that myths evolve uh, in the same way that humans have evolved and the changes in those myths and the complexity and depth of, of the uh, stories uh, has increased as uh, uh, human uh, development has become more complex. So that's everything I know about that topic and we're gonna move on. All right, so the author suggests that um, every civilization or culture develops unique visions of God that are suitable for their time in history. Those, that's my summary of what I think she said. And in time, uh, people would outgrow that vision, and so a new interpretation is required. And we've often commented in this class uh, about the differences that we have perceived between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. And I think that's going to be important. You know, we have a very harsh God who sometimes toys with uh, people, with humanity, um, sometimes is very uh, angry and so forth in the Old Testament. And then we have the image of uh, Jesus as the extension of, of God in the New Testament, who is loving and caring and uh, wants better things for us and so on and so forth. Um, the author says that any notions of God that didn't have flexibility tended not to survive. And uh, she says each generation has to create the image of God that works for it. Um, and, and then she asks this, is modern atheism a denial of God, which is no longer adequate to the problems of our time? And if you want to talk about that for a minute or two, I'd be happy to. It's uh, an interesting observation. Um, you know, I feel like in some ways we've probably seen that with some of our young people in the church that um, grew up with the same Sunday school uh, stories that we did and yet have moved away from it because um, those those stories and those experiences weren't, uh, apparently were not adequate for um, life as they understood it. Anybody want to comment on that? I thought that was probably the the most important point that I gained from reading the first chapter, that God has 
our ideas of God have to be effective or we find new ideas about God that are that work for us. She also talked about um, fundamentalism a little bit. And sometimes I look at atheists as fundamentalists in that they are determined that there is no God because there's no proof of God. And, and so it kind of is the opposite of the fundamentalist religious person because that person believes in God no matter what. I mean, there, there isn't any gray areas is what I'm trying to say for these people, for, yeah. for, for fundamentalists. Okay. All right, let's 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 talk about some of the common visions of God. This is not really part of the chapter, but I think it goes along with it. And, I, and again, I'm trying to put us all on um, maybe some common footing here as, as we approach this. Uh, what are some ways of looking at God that you are aware of uh, historically or in your life experience or uh, in your reading? Um, what, what are the different isms that by which we define God? I think of it as all knowing and all seeing. Okay. Male. Male, okay. Creator. Creator. Savior. Savior, okay. Anyone else? The alpha and the omega. Beginning and the end. Okay. Spirit. Spirit. Uh, loving. Okay. I guess I, I was thinking um, a little bit more along basic lines. Y'all, you guys are very sharp students and you're always about three steps ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> So I was thinking in terms of, um, you know, what religions think about God. So I'll just give you a hint here, and we'll start uh, with the first one, and that is monotheism, uh, which is uh, going to be relevant to the religions that we're studying in this book, and that, of course, says there is one true God. Um, monotheists, especially in the Old Testament days, uh, might acknowledge the existence of other supernatural beings, but there's only one God that really, that really matters. Um, you know, in the Old Testament, other gods were acknowledged, even in the Ten Commandments, uh, other gods are acknowledged, but uh, Yahweh was demanding of, of the people that they worship only him. And so the great monotheistic uh, Christ, uh, religions of the world are Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Sikhism, and Zoroastrianism, which is, uh, came from, from Persia. Now, within uh, monotheism, this kind of goes along with what I think Jane, uh, some of what Jane was saying, uh, there are some, some subsets, uh, ways of looking at, at God. Um, and I'll say, uh, just to get us started, the first one is the, the theistic, the theistic view of God. What is the theistic view? That's too big a word. Too big a word. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll just, I'll just go ahead. So theism is the view of God that many of us probably have, that God is, is present with us. Uh, God is accessible uh, through prayer. God is involved in human life. And when we say a prayer, sometimes prayers are answered, sometimes they're not. Um, but regardless of, of what the answer to the prayer is, uh, the belief of the individual is that uh, God is involved with me. Uh, so what's the other side? What's the, not really the opposite, but what's the extension of theism that looks as God, looks at God as more distant? Deism. Deism, okay. Um, so deism uh, suggests that in uh, some intelligent being created the universe but doesn't really keep in contact with us, doesn't respond to prayers. And this is the notion 
uh, of a clockmaker God, the God who winds up the clock and sets it down, and then uh, the clock takes care of itself and keeps time, and, and we're kind of on our own after that. Uh, there were some famous deists in American history, uh, some of the early, uh, I guess we'd say the forefathers of our country. So Jefferson, Franklin were two that I'm aware of. I think maybe Madison was, um, who sort of, uh, deism was kind of coming into vogue back in the 1700s, and I think they uh, related to that. How about Thomas Paine? <laughs> Thomas Paine, Okay. And then I'm going to add one more subset for monotheism, and that is the development of the Trinity. And of course, we all know what that is, uh, three distinct entities that make up uh, one God. And people have argued uh, back and forth over the centuries as to whether this is really monotheism or not. But um, I think for the sake of what we're doing here, um, it's probably okay. Well, just a right. little bit of uh, etymology here, but... Uh... The word deus, deist, theist, Zeus, and, well, I guess that about does it, but Zeus and deus are cognate words. Okay. Hmm. Think about it. All right, and then we have polytheism, um, of course, belief in many gods. A lot of these religions came out of Egypt or the Middle East or African tribal religions. Um, Hinduism has many thousands of Hindu gods, but they all make up one supreme god, one Brahman, and that's the notion of henotheism, which means you have one god who's in charge of everything else, but there's lots of, of lesser gods, and that's also seen in some of uh, the Native American religions. Pantheism, God is nature, and nature is God, and the two are inseparable. Jeremy, did you want to say something? I was going to say, it's also somewhat uh, in Catholicism with all the saints. Okay, well, we could look at it that way. Um, to, so God is the universe around us, the pantheists. Uh, this takes up a lot of ancient uh, pagan beliefs as well as uh, modern-day uh, Wicca religions. And then uh, Jane mentioned the atheists, and that includes uh, agnosticism. Uh, this was a term that was coined by Thomas Henley, Henry Huxley in 1869, and there's two elements or two aspects of agnosticism. Uh, the first is uh, the person says, if there is a God, he or she is unknowable. Uh, so this is kind of almost like deism, except uh, we're not certain that there's a God. And then the second aspect of agnosticism is that it is unknown if God exists or not, but the person is open to evidence if evidence arises. And so this is for Nadine. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is one of her uh, favorite teaching scientists. And he is, uh, if, if he, when he's asked in uh, his presentations, you know, do you believe in God? He will say, I am a Huxleyan agnostic. And uh, that means that he's open to evidence, but he, he just doesn't have enough evidence at this time. And then finally, we have atheism or humanism uh, that suggests there is no God and that people are capable of doing good or of morality uh, on their own account. All right. Any questions about any of that? I have. Okay. Go ahead. Well, there was... Uh... I thought it was interesting that they, in the chapter, the, the pagan um, believers thought that um, the followers or believers in Yahweh were atheists because they only believed in one God. I thought that was kind of interesting. That That's, huh. I didn't, I guess, you know, you'd have to assume that there are degrees of atheism, I guess, to do that, huh? Well, so I, I, I was kind of curious because they were, Accused the uh, uh, accused them of being atheists. And then there was um, Marcus Ward used to talk about, and I can't, I probably can't tell you what it means, but panentheism versus pantheism. How how is that different? Do you remember? I've heard the word before. I didn't. Well, that's why I was getting my slide. Let's see if I can find it. <laughs> it's God is nature, but He's in nature, and I would. I'm not sure I can explain it, so I'm going to see if uh, I can find out. 
Okay. While you're looking for that, I'm going to go on to the next slide here. Um, I was trying to put, um, you know, these different beliefs in God sort of on a, on a spectrum. Uh, and I realized after I created this, that it kind of makes it look like we, we moved through the spectrum from left to right. And I really didn't mean to <laughs> imply that. Um, I, I, so, so look at this as a spectrum. Don't worry about uh, the fact that I didn't have a very good graphic for that. Um, so we have theism, just to review, which is more traditional. God is personal. God is close to us. Jane mentioned the term fundamentalist. Um, and what the author said about fundamentalism is that uh, people who embrace uh, fundamental beliefs in God tend to be anti-historical. Uh, they don't really care if uh, new discoveries in history would would change the minds of some about their beliefs. Uh, for them, the belief and, and faith are, are the critical elements of their experience with God. Uh, the theist believes that God answers prayer and uh, God reveals one himself or herself. Uh, the deist, a little bit less traditional. God is more of a sacred mystery that's kind of out there, but not really involved, distant. Um, and this is kind of moving now toward the more flexible uh, uh, posture of accepting new evidence or, you know, if things change, maybe I need to, to change my view a little bit about God. Uh, prayer is not so relevant and, and God seems to be in hiding. And then the agnostics, uh, we talked about God may be out there, but we don't know for sure. And then the atheists, uh, God is, is absent. Did you find hey, your definition there, Dennis? This probably won't be enough, but it says, um, the concept of panentheism imagines God as the encompassing spirit in whom everything that is, is. The universe is not separate from God, but in God. And he breaks down the word panentheism. Pan means everything. In, E-N means in, I-N. And theism comes from the Greek word for of God, mm -hmm. which is theos. Um, I don't know if that I wonder, if, you know, the, the hint, one of the Hindu concepts of God is that God is the ocean and we're the, all of the universe are the little droplets of water that make up the ocean. I wonder if that's panentheism. Uh, I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't know the answer. I'm just, uh, it's a rhetorical question, I guess. All right, and so before we move on uh, from this little introduction, uh, does the Latter-day Saint tradition influence our vision of God? Is there anything you can think of in our tradition that might have an impact on how we view God? The God still, still speaks today. Okay, the revelatory revelation, very important. <clears throat> Anything else? I guess what stood out for me was the, go ahead. Somebody was going to talk. I was thinking about talking. <laughs> <laughs> that made me count. Maybe it was just a reverberation or something. I yeah, it, was my, it was my mind. My temporal lobe epilepsy. <laughs> well, I did have something that I was thinking about when you were first started the class. Um, you know, when you were talking about Joseph Smith, and you were talking about what you know, what kind of belief, belief systems, and if the belief system doesn't, I, I, for a lack of a better word, help the society anymore, it's kind of abandoned. And I think Joseph Smith taught our ancestors, and then therefore me, that it's okay to look at something and change it if God is saying that it's okay to change it, which is, of course, controversial because nobody can definitely agree on it. But that is what he taught us. Yeah, and interesting point. I, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I would not have thought of that. Well, what stood out to me was I remembered the stories of, of Joseph in the grove and being confronted by the two image images of two personages with bright light. Um, and that for me in, in my younger years, not so much now, but um, determined that, that I saw God very much as a personage, uh, just like Jesus. Um, 
So, so that, that affected me. That's a Latter-day Saint tradition for sure and influenced my vision of God. What about the light on the river? The what? The light on the river. I don't know that story. You'll have to tell it. When Sarah Lively, and I don't know who else, was baptized in the uh, uh, in Ontario, and a, and a shaft of light came down. I, I haven't heard it, but okay. Um, Sarah Lively is Russ's great-great-grandmother, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's in the church history. Oh, I, I, maybe I was gone that day. I missed it. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I'm I, sorry. Have, the, uh, I have the transcript of, of uh, the people who were there, uh, the experience. But, okay. So, and so the image of God is light. Um, you know, yes. certainly that goes with a lot of visionary experiences, speaks, I think. Speaks out loud. These are my people. Yeah. And you shall not make fun of them. It, that was no... No, that wasn't the exact words, but um, shall not mock them, I think was the word. Okay. All right. As, as we begin in the first chapter, I'm going to start with a couple of questions uh, just to make sure that we share common definitions on some things. Um, what's the difference between belief and faith? Are they different or are they the same thing? Well, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Well, some of how we discuss God and religion depends on the language we speak. Uh, my Dutch friend, <laughs> uh, Leo Van Klinken, who did a lot of translating for the church, said that, you know, it was a real problem in Dutch, you know, he said, Americans have all these arguments about faith and belief, and in Dutch, there's only one word. I can't split it. Hmm. So, you know, we are somewhat limited in our thoughts sometimes by the way we express ourselves. Yeah. And maybe well, there is no difference between faith and belief. Maybe the Dutch have it right. Well, I a lot of people use these two interchangeably. The reason I bring this up is because when the author talks about Abraham, uh, the faith of Abraham, uh, she kind of gives it some context. And that's the first time I'd ever really thought about it. And that's why I wanted to, to mention it now. Dennis? Well, I kind of think of belief as an intellectual approach and faith as an attitude. Okay. I think of belief as the principles that you uh, choose to follow. And faith is is how you um, accept that those are correct and that they will uphold you. Okay. I've always thought that faith was without any um, any proof. You still have faith. And then belief is what you do with it. it. It's your beliefs is how you process it. The, the faith comes first and then the belief is the action. So, so that's very interesting, Robin. Uh, technically, the, the, the definition of belief is, is what you said the definition of faith was. Uh, the, 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 the word belief comes from an ancient Saxon word, leaf, and it means things as I wish them to be. It's, it's how I believe the world to be, how I think that the world works. And the reason I brought this up about faith is because in the story of Abraham, Armstrong talks about uh, his experience with the sacrifice uh, of, of, or the intended sacrifice of Isaac was an expression of faith. In other words, Abraham trusted God so much that he was willing to, to go through something that he knew would, would take the life of his son away from him. And I'd never really thought about faith uh, uh, in that way before, but she, she presents it that faith is the action word. Faith is the, you know, I'm going to go out and do what, based on what I believe. So her definitions would be 180 degrees different than yours. I, and now I think it's okay to each person have their own definition, but that's how the author puts it. And I, I'd never thought of that in relation to faith before. 
All right, one other question. What's a myth? She talks a lot about myths in, in her writing. A myth is an explanation of something that is observed. It's an explanation like of something that is observed. The sun so rises myth... in the sky, a guy in a golden chariot drives it across the sky. Okay. Because I can think of lots of explanations of things that are observed that are scientific, but I wouldn't consider them myths. The Bohr atom is a myth. Okay. We don't believe in it anymore, but it's in my chemistry textbook. Yep. What atom? The Bohr, uh, the the explanation of a nucleus with little uh, uh, electrons and protons that look like BBs and little things that look like BBs orbiting around like planets. Oh, well, that's Bohr not true. Was the name of a scientist that had that... B B O H R. B O H R. Yep. You don't find that in te chemistry textbooks anymore. That's a myth. But it was true. All right. So here's the, the technical definition of a myth. It's a traditional story in, in the sense that we're studying it in this book. I guess we'll, we'll stick to, to what our book is about here for today. So a myth is a traditional story, uh, particularly one concerning uh, early historical people or explaining some natural or social uh, phenomenons and typically involving supernatural beings or events. So people used myths to explain events that they did not understand, okay? It's a story that was made up to explain why is the volcano blowing its top? Why was there an earthquake last night? Why is there a deluge that's uh, washing out all of my crops? Um, those kinds of things. Well, it must be the gods. It must be the volcano god is angry. It must be... Uh, I did something wrong, and now uh, God is getting me back for it. So it can be any kind of a story that explains those events. And then another definition uh, that's maybe is more a modern definition is a widely held but false belief or idea. And we're not going to use that, okay? We're not... Again, all of these beliefs that we're talking about, whether they're valid to us or not, they're valid to somebody. And so we're not going to declare my beliefs as truth and somebody else's uh, beliefs as false ideas. So I, I want to use the first definition as we go forward, if that's okay. Are there any myths in the Bible? Sure. One or two. Yeah. <laughs> any comments? Other the comments? Adam and Eve story is so like the Pandora story. Okay. All right. Well, we'll engage these as we go along. I'm not going to address right now, but uh, all right. Chapter one, in the beginning, we only spent uh, 43 minutes on the introduction. I'm going to, I'm going to talk quickly through this and just kind of summarize the chapter if that's okay. So in this chapter, uh, Armstrong uh, presents uh, a number of ancient religions and kind of what they contributed to human beliefs uh, in God or about God. And she talks about this theory, I think, because it's, it's a theory because uh, it's not well established. There's not a lot of, there, there's not written records to support it. Uh, this is just kind of what uh, some scholars think maybe the early the very earliest humans uh, might have thought about God. And so in the beginning, uh, humans created a God who was the first cause of all things and the ruler of heaven and earth. This is her terminology. Um, and it started out as a, a primitive monotheism, but it eventually faded. And she calls this, this entity the sky god. And the sky god uh, watched people and punished people from time to time, but was largely absent from their daily life. And as history went along, was replaced later on uh, by gods who were more accept accessible. We would call these pagan gods. And she says this is kind of similar to uh, some African tribal forms of worship that actually have persisted to this day. And I know some of the uh, Christianity is very important in Africa now, and I know some of my Ghanaian friends who are, are ministers and very active in, in usually the Pentecostal uh, churches 
uh, they're very concerned about the beliefs of their parents or their grandparents because the parents are still embracing uh, some of these ancient uh, uh, beliefs of multiple gods that are involved in their lives. Um, so this ancient vision of the sky god uh, came from the Paleolithic age before 10,000 BCE, so a long, long time ago. Um, they think that people probably had an early sense that there were spirits in the world uh, that were there to help them uh, understand the mysteries of the universe and to link those mysteries with their daily lives. And one area that was particularly important as agriculture was beginning was that they had gods who were uh, involved with helping the crops to grow, so fertility gods. And, you know, this is a typical uh, artifact, uh, very well endowed lady here, uh, <laughs> clearly capable of uh, feeding her children. And, um, you, know, you know, these are the typical kinds of things that uh, these mother goddesses uh, uh, were uh, the ways in which were thought about the mother goddesses who, who uh, helped the crops to grow. Um, the gods enabled humanity to describe reality that was too complex to express in other ways. Uh, the myths of these ancient people were not necessarily intended to be taken literally. Uh, they were just stories about uh, what they postulated was going on in the universe. And the sacred world of the gods uh, was kind of an ideal uh, to which the humans should aspire and a prototype for human existence. And that kind of reminded me of the Garden of Eden story before the fall, you know, how, how great everything was, uh, how perfect human, human life was, and, you know, being there in the garden, uh, walking around, and God was actually physically present with Adam and Eve. And we all would like to, you know, get back to that kind of an existence again. All right, then the Babylonians. The Babylonian vision of God is recorded in uh, writings called the Enuma Elish, which is an epic poem accounting the Mesopotamian creation stories and telling the victory of the gods over chaos, uh, thought to have been written somewhere between 1900 and 1600 BCE. And it's on uh, clay tablets that have been discovered uh, with cuneiform script. That's the little triangles that they punched into the clay and uh, made a language out of it. And according to the Enuma Elish, uh, the world uh, before the gods was a formless, watery, swampy void. And out of that, three uh, gods initially emerged, and that was Apsu, the god of the rivers, Tiamat, the dragon queen or the salt sea god, and Mumu, who was the god of chaos, which reminds me of Loki in the Marvel movies, if any of you watch those. Um, and then there was a succession of many other gods that were created by the first uh, gods and the one who became the most uh, significant, kind of the equivalent of the sky god or the sun god was, was Marduk. And here's all of the Babylonian gods. Uh, we'll memorize this and we'll be giving you a quiz next week on that. Uh, but the ones that were the two most important in a great conflict that took place was Marduk and Tiamat, the dragon queen, those two there. So Apsu and Tiamat came together and created lots of other gods, including Marduk. Um, and the story goes that all of these young gods got to partying and they were making too much noise. And Apsu became angry because he wasn't able to sleep. And so because he couldn't sleep, he started a great war. And on one side, we have Apsu and Tiamat. And on the other side, uh, we have Marduk, who's leading the rebellion. And Marduk uh, kills Tiamat and makes the earth out of her body. That's the, the creation story from the Babylonian era. And then he also kills another one of his sibling gods, whose name was Enki, or in the text, Armstrong uh, calls this god Kingu. And uh, this is one of the uh, siblings who sided with Apsu and Tiamat. And so uh, uh, Marduk takes the blood of Enki and mixes it with the dust of the earth. And that's how humans were created. So humans were a little bit, a little bit God and a little bit dust of the earth, a little one a part of each. Uh, some scholars think that the Enuma Elish was a prototype for Genesis, and others will say that both were conceived individually from stories that were shared among early people. 
but what they do have in common, uh, both the Genesis story and the Enuma Elish, the earth starts out as a void, formless, dark, empty uh, place that is covered with water. Um, then in the Enuma Elish, the beings are created after Apsu and Tiamat were also gods, but in Genesis, uh, the first beings were a little lower than the god. And if you think about it, the mixing of the blood of the god and the, and the dust together uh, would make a creation that's a little bit lower than not quite a god, but almost a god. So there's, you can kind of see the relationship there, I think. Uh, but in both cases, humans were created from the dust of the ground. All right, any questions about Babylon? We're going to move on to Canaan. Like I said, I'm going to go through these very quickly so we can kind of have a few minutes to talk at the end. All right, in the mythology of uh, Canaan, the god Baal or Bel, uh, who we have encountered before, was both a god of uh, fertility as well as the prince, lord of the earth, uh, among all of the Canaanite gods, and this began around 1400 BCE. Uh, Baal was also known to be worshipped in Egypt. Um, technically, Baal was the god of rain or the god of the storm, and every year he lived his life as part of the agricultural uh, cycle. And so in the beginning of the year, in the spring, he would do battle with Mot, the god of death, and he would be tricked into going to live in the netherworld. And then at the, every year in the Middle East, uh, when the summer's heat was coming to an end, that's the beginning of the growing season. And so um, Baal is resurrected, he returns to the earth, and he brings the rains in the fall, which enabled the crops to grow. So their growing season is a little bit different. I remember when I went to uh, Saudi Arabia in February, and that's the rainy season in the desert. And as we were looking out the windows of the aircraft uh, going into Riyadh, I was amazed at how much, how green the desert actually was. Now it's very short, very short grass. It's not very significant. But from that perspective, uh, we were able to see that something actually could grow in the desert. And so Baal was the one who was responsible for making the crops grow. All right, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, Abraham. Abraham uh, was believed to be a wandering Mesopotamian chieftain around 1815 BC, 1850 BCE uh, during the first Hebrew settlement of Cana. And then there were two others that would follow in the next several hundred years after that. Um, the author says the early Israelites may have actually been a confederation of various ethnic groups uh, that found themselves bound together by their loyalty to uh, the one true God, Yahweh. Um, the God of Abraham is a God who, uh, in the description in, in Genesis, uh, is much more involved in the world than some of the previous gods have been. Uh, Abraham called God El Shaddai, which means God Almighty or God of the mountains. And El Shaddai actually shows up at Abraham's tent with two angels and they visit and they come. Uh, Abraham uh, expresses his hospitality and El Shaddai and the two angels come and sit down and have a meal with Abraham. So this is a very, very personal um, perspective about God for the Old Testament. And then uh, Abraham and Sarah uh, give birth to Isaac, and uh, the belief in Abraham's time was that the first child uh, was the result of a union of one of the gods with a human. This is a, a pagan belief, and uh, oftentimes those children were sacrificed, and the story was supposed to be that the gods were the, the god who had uh, impregnated the human was tired from uh, the the lovemaking or whatever, and in order to help replenish the god's energy that was lost during procreation, they had to sacrifice this eldest child, uh, and the the god would then take the child's energy back. Uh, but in Abraham's case, Isaac is spared. Uh, it's a great story. Then God uh, provides a sacrifice for Abraham to give, and Abraham learns to trust God. And this is um, for Robin, this was where that uh, definition about the essence of faith is, as being what uh, drives us to, uh, to do something based on our beliefs uh, that comes from. And so Abraham now has a new relationship with God and has found faith in God. 
And uh, these are the words of the author again, uh, Abraham, the, in the Abraham story, God is both close and intimate, coming in to have a meal in a tent, uh, but also uh, she refers to God as, as despotic and a capricious sadist, I guess, because of the Isaac story. So, um, so sometimes there's uh, discontinuity in, in uh, some of these uh, beliefs about God that coexist with one another. If anybody has something to say, I'm just kind of barging forward here to, to get through these, but please feel free to stop me and, and make a comment if you, or, or if you have a question. <laughs> All right, then we have Moses, and in the Mosaic vision of God, uh, God is now called Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh is very distant. He's up on the mountain. Uh, the description uh, of God on Mount Sinai when, uh, when Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments is, is a mountain that is literally enveloped in smoke and lightning. And a lot of people uh, have looked at this and said, well, that, that's a volcano. What we're talking about is God is present in uh, volcanic activity there on Mount Sinai. So his presence was very terrifying. And um, when Moses uh, confronts God, he wants to know what God's name is. And God says, I am who I am. And I used to think that was just the coolest story that, I mean, how cool was God to come up with that? I am who I am. Uh, you know, name is, is not important. Um, and in the tradition of the world at that time, uh, having the name of a God or knowing the name of a person uh, to some extent gave the individual power over that, that entity. And so I always kind of grew up with the idea that God didn't want to give Moses any power over, over him, over himself. Um, so he just told Moses, I am who I am. But what the author says in the book is that uh, the Hebrew, the translation of uh, that statement, I am who I am, is God saying, mind your own business. I don't want you to know who I am. And so uh, God is terrifying. God is distant. Um, God only wants to participate with Israel in its history if, um, if Israel agrees to some things. We call that a covenant. Uh, so we have a God here who's kind of like making a contract with the people and, and wants them to, um, to sign on to be obedient and do what, what God wants them to do. Um, some see Moses' God as, as brutal, uh, passionately partisan. You think of uh, the escape from Egypt and God sending the angel to come in and kill all the babies, uh, and, you know, kind of a murderous God. You can take from that what you wish, uh, but, but those are the, vis the views of some people about that, that uh, uh, way of, of understanding God in the mosaic sense. But uh, there's also an early depiction of God as being on the side of the, opp the oppressed and the impotent, and so God is taking care of the slaves and trying to help them get out of Israel. So there's, again, there's kind of a dichotomy uh, between is God a, a good God or is God a bad God and an angry God all of the time. Comments? Okay. Um, I, I wanted to address this uh, statement that she makes here. Armstrong says that some see the Exodus story as a mythical rendering of a successful peasant's revolt against the suzerainty of Egypt and its allies in Canaan. Did anybody wonder what that was about? Anybody know? I don't think there was any proof of it though. She even admitted that. Mm -hmm. It was, I thought that was like her interpretation. So, um, the, 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 go ahead. I don't know what these words mean. Um, Sarah suzerainty. Um, so, so suzerainty is like uh, when the Romans came in and uh, took over uh, uh, the the Middle East, Canaan. Uh, that means that they were in charge. Okay, they they were the legal authority in Canaan. The Roman Empire was. And at that time in history, what she's saying is that some people view this, uh, the Exodus story or the whole Moses story as a time in history, uh, not when the Jews were in Egypt, but when Egypt was in, was in Canaan. 
And I just wondered if anybody had ever had ever heard that. And I'm okay. sorry, I, I interrupted Jane. So sorry. Okay, I'll, let, let, I'll tell you. I'll tell you about this. So uh, we all grew up with the Moses story. Uh, it was a, a critical part of our religious training. And, um, you know, we, we watched flannel graphs or, or the younger people may have watched videos or something like that. Uh, uh, I've heard several is, uh, Israeli archaeologists talk about this problem. And um, the Israeli government over the years has uh, funded archaeological uh, digs, studies of the Sinai Peninsula and the Arabian Peninsula, looking for evidence that Moses uh, actually took a large group of people, we're talking 100,000 people or more, out of Egypt, and then they ran around in the wilderness for 40 years before they came into Canaan. And the Israeli government, no, nobody would have more uh, meaning or importance attached to, to being able to demonstrate the archaeological uh, historicity of that story than Israel. Okay, that, that's what they're trying to say is, you know, this is our home because God gave us this place. And in all of those studies, uh, there has never been... I, I don't believe, at least what I, this is what I understand. There's never been one artifact that has been uncovered that adequately suggests that a large group of people left Israel, ran around Sinai, and then wound up in Canaan. And one archaeologist explained it like this. He said, in, in America, um, there, there is evidence that people from Norway, the Vikings, came to the Americas before the year 1000 or sometime around in there. It was a very small group, enough to fit in a boat or two. They only spent about 10 years, and then they went back to Norway. And he said there, there's all kinds of evidence that those people were there. They, they left artifacts that an archaeologist would look at and say, you know, that, that probably happened. And they've never been able to demonstrate anything similar in, in the Middle East with respect to the Moses story. Now, um, 100,000 people running around in the desert, they should be able to find something. That was his point. What there is evidence of is that uh, probably sometime around 14, 1500 BCE, uh, Egypt came into Canaan and actually took control, much the way that the Roman Empire did in the time, had control in the time of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, for some unknown reason, uh, the Egyptians left Canaan about the time of the Moses story. Uh, they don't know if it was a societal collapse. They don't know if it was an economic collapse. They haven't been able to explain it yet. But the uh, Egyptians clearly withdrew and went back to Egypt. And so his theory is that that event, whatever, whatever happened, uh, is what turned into the Moses story. That the, as, as the people told the story generation to generation, uh, it wasn't that Egypt left us. It was that we left Egypt. Okay, that's what I know about it. That's, uh, you know, what, what has been explained and, um, you know, what the, the scholarly uh, vision of all of this is. Remember, I said uh, this is going to be tough, some of it, because it's going to conflict with the stories that we've been brought up with. Uh, but at least uh, that's what the archaeological evidence demonstrates as far as we know. All right. So uh, back to God. I, yes, I read that uh, there is some were some monuments in Egypt where a name was erased that they think was Moses, which would uh, go along more with the biblical version. I could be. I, I'm not aware of that, but if the you know if the name was erased, I don't know. It'd be hard to say whose name was on there. Maybe, huh? Hey, Paul. I, yeah. I just wanted to uh, talk about how when I read this chapter. It kind of made made that book that we read, Speak to the Bones, really make sense to me in terms of why God was so angry and telling all the prophets to tell people to believe in me or you're going to die. Because it, it was that time of warring between the monotheists and the polythe polytheists. And I think mythology was important. Like you said earlier, the mythology of the Exodus 
was very, very important to the early Jews. That's the story they needed to tell each other. Mm -hmm. And that fit in with the way people in that time talked about how God was involved in their life. So mm -hmm. it, it made more sense to me then. I, I thought it was weird that he was so angry all the time and <laughs> telling people they're going to die. You yeah, know? yeah. Well, it's interesting to me, just the difference between Abraham and Moses, how intimate God was for Abraham, and yet for Moses, um, how, how angry God seems to be, you know, how, how scary God is. All right, um, I'm going to move on. Um, there, the, she talks about the Vedic vision of God. Uh, that's how uh, understandings about God were believed to have come to India and Pakistan. And this was from a group called the Aryans, who were Indo-Europeans from Persia. Um, again, uh, you know, this book was written in the 1990s, and there has been new information uh, that has come from archaeology and also from DNA analysis um, that, that suggests that probably these Indo-Europeans didn't come down to India at all. Uh, that that was something that actually the British came up with back in the 1800s to, um, to to make it seem like their colonization of India was was appropriate to do because the Europeans had been there before. Mm -hmm. But regardless of how uh, the the Vedas got uh, to Pakistan and India, uh, this is a story called the Odes of the Rig Veda, uh, which was the basis of their religious thought. Um, Let's see. Uh, the Vedic texts were likely written between 1200 and 900 BCE. Uh, this is a map that kind of shows uh, on, on the right hand side there, the purple uh, was the original uh, thought that the uh, Aryans came from the area around uh, Iran. That's what a uh, script from the Rig Veda looks like. And the Vedas do not try to explain the mysteries of existence, but they how, explain how to come to terms with the wonders and terrors of the world. And this was the notion of karma was being introduced, that we can't blame the gods for our actions. Destiny comes as a consequence of our decisions and behavior. Uh, they believed in Brahman, which was the supreme power that sustains everything. And the practice of yoga or the yoking of the powers of the mind and discovery of inner meaning through meditation, body positions and breathing uh, practices was coming into vogue. And there was decreased emphasis on the physical and the material. Uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, uh, the intent was not to deny the gods, but to diminish their importance and the uh, people were seeking ways to try to transcend uh, the importance of the gods, the Upanishads. We hear Dr. Uh, Thomas Cam or Joseph Campbell talking about the Upanishads a lot. Those were uh, written between the 8th and the 5th centuries BCE, and they urged people to cultivate a sense of Brahman uh, or of that supreme being in, in everything and try to learn how to transcend human activity. Uh, Siddhartha Gautama, that was the, that was the Buddha. Uh, he sought to discover ways to reduce the pains of existence by looking uh, inward, and his teachings were that they could uh, gain release from uh, the pains of life uh, by being compassionate, by sp speaking gently and behaving gently, uh, and re refraining from anything that clouds the mind. So that would allow people to transcend all pain and leads uh, ultimately to enlightenment. Uh, then she talks about the philosophers, uh, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, Plato embraced the views of Pythagoras that the soul was a fallen uh, deity incarcerated into the body. Uh, Aristotle believed that we needed to understand the universe through logic and science, uh, but to be intellectually humble, recognizing that not one person has all the truth, but that we, that we all are capable of contributing understanding and Aristotle referred to God as the unmoved mover, uh, pure being, eternal, immobile, spiritual. Uh, God is pure thought and humans by virtue of their intellect are connected to God. Spiritual and mind connection uh, was my way of understanding this. All right. 
Um, any questions? I know we kind of went through that quickly. I don't think it'll be quite so bad in, in chapters to come, but this was just a lot of uh, centuries that we had to try and cover in, in, in one day. Um, so uh, this was one, I think this is one of the questions that Dennis had last week that we didn't get to, and I wanted to use it. Um, a human understanding of God has changed over the centuries. As different cultures of the world uh, meet and merge, are we on the cusp of a major metamorphosis in our understanding of God in this day and age? Anybody like to try to address that in the uh, about five minutes that we have left? I'll take a shot. Okay. So I think, at least in America, which is our experience, our world is going into fundamentalism one way or another. So the fundamentalist um, Christians are, are have an absolute God and then, you know, have the absolute experience of Christ and there's no, you, you don't do not question it. And then you have the people who reject that. And I think that we don't have an alternative for people who have rejected that. And that's where this fundamentalist atheism kind of comes in. Well, I'm gonna reject everything that I learned in my childhood, but I don't have a replacement. And so those of us who are kind of in the middle are trying to help our younger generations find a new understanding of God. I guess when I think of humans from the early mists of time to now, they, they've been searching for God and their concept has changed over time. I don't know, I think of that hymn that we don't sing much anymore. I don't know if it's even in the new hymnal. We limit not the truth of God to our poor reach of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this book is going to make me understand more than ever that I need to be open to understanding God, that I shouldn't ever feel that I have it all figured out. Does anybody feel that their understanding about God in, in their life has changed uh, just from childhood to adulthood to older adulthood? Um, you know, I always wondered, the Apostle Paul talked about uh, when I was a child, I thought as a child and I behaved as a child. And then as I became older, I looked at the world in new ways. And I wonder if he was talking about um, at least partly his relationship with God, because I feel like that happens. Does anybody else? Well, yes. Aware of differences? I, I think my understanding has changed. And when I was a child... I could not understand the complexity of life yet. I would have to mature into that. Um, I, I appreciate my uh, the Bible stories of my youth, but there's more to it than that. As my... Uh, what little I know about the universe has expanded. Um, my ideas about God have, have changed over time also. When you contemplate a universe that's 15 billion years old, God becomes kind of a different being than when you think of as just uh, a, our solar system or just our earth with the sun and the moon, whatever. I think part of the metamorphosis of growing old and having life experiences is having that personal relationship with God. As a kid, I, I really wasn't taught or didn't absorb the fact that it would be um, such a relationship on a personal level.
All right. Well, I think we probably should go ahead and wrap this up. I hope uh, I hope you found the discussion interesting. I know the reading was very challenging for me to uh, try to put everything into words and, and to do it in a way that we could finish it in an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and I hope everybody is uh, interested and willing to go forward with, with this text. Um, I, I feel like I am going to learn a lot as we share together. And again, I don't want anything uh, that I say, I'm, I'm basically just sharing with you what I read or what I understood from what I read. Uh, and the same goes for all of the instructors. Nobody's trying to change you or change your beliefs, but uh, just to help us have a greater understanding for the diversity of belief about God that uh, exists in our world and, and have uh, come down to us through, through many uh, centuries of stories and writings and so forth. So thank you for your attention. I apologize that I talked so much this morning. I didn't want to do that, but I didn't know how else to, to really get through it. So um, if anybody has anything else to say, or if you just want to chat for a little bit, we can. And uh, I think we'll you did an excellent job. Oh, thank you. Yes. It was a good overview, Paul. It was a packed chapter. I thought my head was going to explode. Yeah, well, <laughs> mine, mine just about did. <laughs> I was glad you were the teacher. <laughs> that's, that's what I said. I said, oh, my gosh, we picked the right teacher to start us out. <laughs> well, I hope I hope it gets a little easier from here on out. This is. Thank you, Paul. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. I think it's important to study this stuff because, you know, we're such a diverse world. And, you know, as we get to know other people, we get little glimpses of, of where they are in life. And it helps us to understand their journey if we kind of see different concepts that different people believe in. Yeah. Well, and, and I like the I like finding the commonalities in beliefs with other religions. Um, that I, it gives me a sense of of uh, a relationship with other people who believe very differently than I do. When when we sometimes have some uh, uh, foundational things that we can point to and say, "Yeah, I, I can see that. I can understand that." Yeah, I think that you know we we talk so much about the youth drawing away, but. I saw that in my youth, too, that, you know, when you get to the high school and college years, you kind of really draw away and um, you're kind of lost and some people find their way back, others don't. Uh, and it just, it's a, it's a continuing journey and each one of us has to walk our own. Well, and our, our beliefs about religion and, and God and spirit are, are not just intellectual. They are part of who we are as individuals. And that may explain why some people, uh, why some people stay and some people go. They may just have a different personality or something different that they're looking for um, that, that they didn't find. Well, some people don't want to make the effort either. I was going to, I really appreciated that quote you put up of Mahatma Gandhi at the beginning, that there are as many religions in the world as there are individuals. Yeah. And I think that kind of speaks to the um, acceptance piece of it for each other and our differences. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, here I am talking about the hymnal again. We've got a new hymn that I thought of while reading the chapter this week. It, and the, the one verse is, we are pilgrims on a journey, here together on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and share the load. Yep. I mean, we're all just trying to figure this out. And I think from the dawn of time, people have been trying to figure out their place in the universe and what it means and how to respond to one another and to God, whoever God is. Absolutely. Life is very complex. It's, we have a lot to deal with. <laughs> Not to blow anybody's mind, but now they're calling it a multiverse. So yeah. it might be bigger. <laughs> <laughs> we might be smaller. I, I can only handle one universe at a time. Yeah. <laughs>
That's I knew I was always just a speck in the universe, but I keep getting tinier the more they explore. <laughs> Actually, you're not because the top five things in your body are the top five things in the universe. So okay, it's kind of this really cool symbolic thing. Who's teaching next Sunday? I don't know. Uh, Dennis, I think it's you. Nope. Oh gosh! I was last Sunday. Maybe, maybe it's Jonathan. maybe it's Jonathan or maybe it's Jonathan. All right, I'll I'll find out because it's either me or Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> I just know I have to start reading the next chapter yeah, now because it takes a while to absorb it. Read chapter two, and and the gauntlet has been thrown because Paul actually got through two chapters. <laughs> it's like oh my god! Jonathan is a teacher next Sunday. <laughs> Maryland. Well, Maryland's the next teacher next Sunday. Oh, okay. Maryland. Okay. I'll talk to Maryland then. Can I can I do the mic drop now, Jane? Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> Put him first. Now we have to do it. <laughs> well, I will have to say I put way more time into getting this lesson ready than I think I ever have in any other Sunday school class in my life. Huh. It's I, I've been I've been laboring over that for weeks trying to figure out how am I going to get this all synthesized into a right. into a class. Well, thank you for taking the time. That's all right. Yes, thank you very much. I can uh, testify to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jane, for picking this book. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like challenges. Do you know that about me? <laughs> yeah, but he was supposed to help paint pictures. Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh huh. <laughs> thing over there that's on the counter. <laughs>